Hey gentlemen, today I think the anabolic doc went a little too far on his most recent video titled How Blocking Estrogen Kills the Major Benefit of TRT with Dr. Bronson, MD. Um, there are a lot of things in this video I disagree with and I think it's kind of stupid and goes against common sense. Uh, so let's just dive right in. Um, they're going to talk about how blocking estrogen kills, it says a major benefit, but the guest that he has on Dr. Bronson is going to list numerous reasons why blocking estrogen is bad. And, uh, I think it's a bit more nuanced than that, but let's go ahead and take a listen. Leave estrogen alone. The benefits of estrogen for men that are on testosterone. This is an interview with a freshly minted testosteronologist, Christopher Bronson, MD. Doctor, let's get right into it. So when you're on testosterone therapy, a lot of people just know that your estrogen levels will go up whenever you give yourself testosterone. And a lot of people have the misconception that your estrogen levels going up is bad. They think it gives you mood lability or instability. They think it makes you more emotional. They think it gives you gynecomastia, which it does. Okay, so he's saying that people have this misconception that high estrogen is bad and that it can make you more labile and it make you a little moody and it can give you gynecomastia. And they said, well, which it can or which it does. So he's admitting that high estrogen can cause gynecomastia, which is or a problem in its own right. Um, but I don't like the derogatory tone he's taking towards individuals who believe that high estrogen can cause side effects because there are two groups of people and, and people in between. There's one group who can tolerate any amount of estradiol to the moon and back, no problem, and they have no side effects. And then there's the other group at the extreme who can only tolerate a little bit of ele elevated estradiol. They're very sensitive to high estradiol side effects or high estrogen side effects. And then there's people all the way in between um, where they're going to have a certain level of estradiol where they're going to start noticing side effects like moodiness, gynecomastia, sleeplessness, insomnia. Um, this is where the roid rage misconception comes from because you're going to have a, a shorter temper with some people. So his derogatory tone towards people who think who are like paranoid, you know, he's kind of acting like they're paranoid about high estrogen. His derogatory tone, I think, is unfounded based on the fact that millions of people on testosterone replacement who have experienced high estrogenic side effects and needed to manage the protocol in order to reduce those side effects and feel well. Um, they think, in other words, they think it's all bad for men to have high estrogen levels. But I will tell you that in the last uh, 15 to especially the last 10 years, we have found that not only does testosterone reduce your subcutaneous fat, which would be the pinchable fat that you can see externally, the type of fat that you can, you know, remove with liposuction, remove with things like tummy tuck surgeries. Um, yes, testosterone reduces that. The way that testosterone reduces visceral fat is an effect not of the testosterone itself, but of estradiol. Estradiol is when your estradiol levels get higher, estradiol inhibits something called lipogenesis inside visceral fat stores. So it makes it much harder to store and build up your visceral fat stores and starts to eliminate those visceral fat stores. Okay, so rightfully so, he's making this claim that estradiol or estrogen can help uh, metabolize visceral fat. Here's the thing though, you can keep your test your testosterone in a healthy range and you can keep your estradiol in a healthy range. You don't need to have your estradiol at 90 picograms per milliliter and have, feel like shit and not be sleeping and be moody and all these side effects so that you can burn your visceral fat. You can manage your estrogen pop properly either through managing your protocol with lowering your dosage and increasing injection frequency or using an aromatase inhibitor to uh, manage your estro estradiol so that it's in a normal range and uh, you can still burn visceral fat because your estradiol is in a healthy range not only this but you can burn visceral visceral fat by diet and exercise so we don't need to just sit on the couch and let you know extremely ele elevated levels of estradiol help us burn our visceral fat because that's not going to do the trick. If you sit on the couch all day eating fucking potato chips and getting your Cheeto dust fingers on, 
you're going to build up visceral fat even if your estrogen's fucking 100 picograms per milliliter. So what's more important to burning visceral fat, estro high estrogen or exercise and diet? It's exercise and diet every fucking time. So by taking aromatase inhibitors, one of the key problems that you get is you do not reduce your visceral fat mass as much as you would by just leaving your estradiol levels wow. alone. Again, I want to say here that you can keep your estradiol levels in a healthy range even while using an aromatase inhibitor as so long as you don't push your estradiol too low. And you can use, again, diet and exercise as a means of reducing visceral fat over just sitting on the fucking couch eating ice cream out of a tub and uh, not taking your aromatase inhibitor and letting your estrogen soar and having side effects so you can't sleep and things like that. Um, so diet and exercise, again, is going to show to be number one for eliminating visceral fat over elevated estrogen. So managing your estrogen with a, an aromatase inhibitor um, is, yes, it, has, it can have deleterious effects on your cholesterol, which is bad for the heart. So it's something that I would use as a last resort. So I'd always, always recommend to adjust your protocol by lowering the dosage or increasing the injection frequency before using an AI. But using an AI is reasonable if you're having side effects and you can't eliminate them via other means. And you, you can use a aromatase inhibitor like an astrazole at a, at a low dose. And you keep your estradiol in a healthy range and you exercise and diet and stay healthy and you're going to have perfectly healthy organs with no visceral fat. Again, diet and exercise bur burns visceral fat much more than uh, sitting on your ass. You're sitting your ass on the couch and letting your estrogen just soar to the moon. Estradiol, uh, in addition to that, also has um, beneficial effects on sexual function, right? So we have all kinds of studies sh and, and just even clinical experience treating men with testosterone who go on AIs Oftentimes, they'll go on an AI, they'll get erectile dysfunction. Uh, this is not the case anecdotally. Um, actually, it's another one of those things where it's not one or zero. It's it's somewhere in the middle, right? So if your estrogen gets too high and you're, and you're a normal individual who's somewhere in the within the normal distribution of, of sensitivity to estrogenic side effects. If your estrogen gets too high, your sexual function is going to decrease. You're going to not, not be able to get as hard. Um, you're going to have decreased penile sensitivity. And if your estradiol gets too low, you're not going to be able to get an erection or you're not going to have uh, sex drive. Um, so there's that healthy middle where you can get w with an aromatase inhibitor. If your estrogen is too high and you're having zero sexual function, you can use an aromatase inhibitor to get your estrogen within a healthy range and get your sexual function back. Um, I've experienced this myself on the steroid cycle. I've seen plenty of people, so many people, thousands of people who have had sexual dysfunction on testosterone replacement, have it restored by either eliminating an AI because their estradiol was too low or introducing an AI because their estradiol was too high. So again, it's not a one or zero, it is somewhere in between. So unopposed testosterone at high levels by itself causes inflammation and damage to those cellular structures. The way that God evolution has given us to, to prevent that is convert some of the testosterone to estradiol and estradiol opposes wow. those cellular actions. So again, there's no evidence here that he's claiming that letting your estradiol just ride high is going to prevent this, this inflammatory effect on endothelial cells. He's just saying that there's you know this evolutionary biological reason for the conversion of testosterone into estrogen that is um, anti-inflammatory and acts as an antioxidant and, and he doesn't mention this but is neuroprotective and cardioprotective you can still you can have your estrogen in a healthy spot by using an aromatase inhibitor and still have the positive effects of estrogen because you still have estrogen being metabolized from free testosterone within your tissues and you also have uh, free floating estradiol um, and other estrogens um, in your serum that make its way through the blood-brain barrier and has action on the CNS. Um, let's just go head to toe. The mood issues, you know, it doesn't affect, this is not DHT blockers. We're not going to go into hair loss. So there's the mood under the, in the brain, right, from the head down, the CNS, like mm -hmm. the mood from the estrogen being, it is, it, there is relevance of the moodiness and men that have, they are, they can feel very well, but they're, 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 
they're moody and they cry easily and they're weepy. It's I've just never forget guys in the beginning mm -hmm. saying, Doc, I can't tell a story without crying or I'm so I go to movies. So here the anabolic doc is actually making an accurate point, which is that um, if elevated estradiol in some individuals can cause them to be very moody and they start weeping at things. And, you know, some somebody on Reddit said that if you're listening to Rolling in the Deep uh, by I believe that song by Adele and you start crying, that means your estrogen is a little, little bit too high. So he's admitting that elevated estrogen can have an effect on mood, but not only can it have an effect on mood, it can have an effect on your, you know, well, mood, it can have an effect on sleep. Um, it can have an effect on your skin care, skin health. Um, it can have an effect on acne. It can have a, an effect on your blood pressure through water retention, which could be poten potentially harmful. So in an, a situation where you're gonna have somebody who is a high aromatizer, and they ha already have a little bit of high blood pressure and they aromatize quite a bit. Uh, estrogen carries water. They're going to have intracellular water retention. Their blood pressure goes up. They're going to have a, a hypertension crisis. Um, it would be better to have this person put an aromatase inhibitor to have that water weight shed and have their blood pressure go down than to just maintain the water retention and the other side effects and put them on a stronger and stronger blood pressure medication. Um, so in, in this case, with somebody who has high blood pressure and is retaining water from estrogen, putting them on an aromatase inhibitor to shed that water um, at a low dose might be w healthier, actually, for the heart than not doing it. But while Doc, it is because it's just disturbing to me. And it's, you know, I'm really in touch with my female side now or I'm just really it's too much or they're moody and short. So it's so we don't know really th th this this ratio of testosterone to estrogen and th again those blockers guys we i don't like them just as a cookie cutter so you so we're going to talk about now how you start testosterone i also agree with him about using an an astrazole right out the gate i think that is completely stupid because again you don't know how much this guy's going to aromatize you're not going to know um, if he's even sensitive to estrogen, because he might not be. There's people I've I've seen individuals with an ultra sensitive estradiol of 200 picograms per milliliter while they're on 400 milligrams of test, and they don't need an aromatase inhibitor. And some people just can cycle up to a gram and don't need an aromatase inhibitor. But I agree with the fact that you shouldn't do this cookie cutter approach where you put somebody on 200 milligrams of test per week with 0.5 milligrams of an astrazole. Uh, twice per week um, because you don't know how this guy's going to react and that that amount of an astrazole could be too much for that individual and that can cause problems so you know like i i always say start on 100 milligrams per week split into two injections with no ai you're going to feel f you should feel totally fine up until your eight week labs and then you can make adjustments from there um, and it's way better than starting out completely maxed out on dosage with uh, and AI and then HCG and you got all these drugs going together um, and it makes it way more difficult to get dialed in and it can cause problems right out of the gate and that can be problematic for somebody who wants to be on testosterone because that can make them scared to get on testosterone again again if, even if they need it if they've had a bad experience and it can also will just make them feel terrible and they don't know why is it the HCG is it the anastrozole I have to wait eight weeks before I get labs like Jesus Christ so I agree with him on the cookie cutter approach being bullshit and um, a lot of TRT clinics do that and I don't like it at all. I think um, start low, titrate up, start without an AI, and if you need to introduce one later, then you can introduce one later and monitor your symptoms and labs along the way. So tell us about the treatment side. Let's go into how do you manage that, man? We can't blow off the estrogen. We're not doing that. So go head, go the head, the brain, the gynecomastia heart maybe prostate sex okay so he says we're not blowing off the estrogen and so i see a, a kind of contradiction here between dr thomas o'connor and dr bronson where dr thomas o'connor is saying hey yeah some people do get this labile mood and they do start weeping at things and they don't like it and they they don't like having these high estrogenic side effects and that these high estrogenic side effects are indeed valid whereas dr bronson here is saying well, there's this misconception basically that high estrogen is bad. And it's like, it's not really a misconception. It's just that that high estrogen can have side effects and it's well documented and it's well known in the TRT and steroid community. 
they go on testosterone, their testosterone level doubles, triples, quadruples, whatever the case. Let's just say it goes from, you know, 300 to 1,000. Okay. They look at their estrog estradiol levels before they start treatment. Let's say it's 30, and then let's say it goes to 50, 60, 70. A lot of men have it in their head that they have to keep their estrogen level under a certain absolute number. But as I was already explaining, the way that you get classically thought to be estrogen related side effects from testosterone is not due to the absolute number of estradiol itself it's due to the ratio of estradiol to testosterone this can be true um in a lot of individuals uh, some people for example if you are on cycle and you're told your total testosterone is 4,000 nanograms per deciliter and you use the aromatase inhibitor to put your estradiol into a normal like human range of like, you know, 20 to 30 picograms per milliliter, you may not feel very good uh, because your estrogen to testosterone ratio ratio is way off. You have a, your testosterone is through the roof and your estrogen is sitting right where a normal human being's uh, estrogen would be sitting. However, uh, me personally on, on cycle, I needed a little bit of physiological, uh, super physiologic amount of estradiol. But if it got above 60 picograms per milliliter on uh, ultra sensitive, I started having moodiness, insomnia. I would get irritated at my roommate more easily. Um, so I started having estrogenic side effects. So I actually did have somewhat of an absolute number that I had to stay below. But there is a, a range, right? So like if, if I pushed it down to the 20s, I probably wouldn't have felt very good. So somewhere between 30 and 50 was where I felt good on, on cycle. And I took, you know, my I did labs quite frequently on cycle to see where I was at. So yes, he, he's, he sounds like a doctor who's frustrated from patients being overly concerned about where their estrogen levels are at. And they're like, oh, doc, my estrogen levels, that's like, for example, me, I did that. My estrogen came back at 70. Um, when I was first on testosterone replacement and I, I messaged my doctor and I was like, Hey, is this concerning? Cause I didn't know if it was concerning or not for my health. I just didn't know. I didn't, I was, I was ignorant. It wasn't ultra sensitive. So he put me on an AI and crushed my estrogen in, into the dirt on my, my, my steroid cycle. Uh, my total testosterone was 4,000 and, um, my estradiol, I needed to keep within a certain range. So and it was super physiologic. I couldn't push my estradiol down into the 20s like a normal human being because I'd have a completely unbalanced estradiol to total testosterone ratio and it would make me feel unwell. Um, however, if my estradiol got, literally, if it got above a certain number, if it got above 60 on an ultra sensitive assay, uh, I would have side effects, sleeplessness, irritability, moodiness, these sorts of things. So I had a specific range that I had to be within somewhere between 40 and 60 where I felt the best on, on cycle. So it's kind of the same way on testosterone replacement where individuals will feel best, you know, some people will feel best between, um, 20 and 40 or if you know, 40 and 60, it, it, it depends where their testosterone is at. It depends where, how they're feeling, um, and their estradiol on paper. And so you got to take all these things into account when you're managing somebody's somebody's protocol and especially taking into account the individual's symptoms. So yes, uh, you don't have to stay below a certain level of estrogen. There's not a specific number of, you know, this many picograms per milliliter of estradiol is bad. So you got to stay below 60, but there is a, a certain range that people generally feel best at. And that is again, man per man, person to person. If you get side effects like gynecomastia, that is due to an elevated estrogen to testosterone ratio. At least that's the, as far as we can determine, that's what causes it. It's not due to your estradiol level, strictly speaking, going from 20 to 40 or whatever it is. It's due to how much estrogen you and have man relative man. to testosterone. So you heard Dr. Thomas O'Connor blurt out there, and it's man per man, which is exactly how it is. There are some individuals who have this kind of proper testosterone to estrogen ratio that kind of go, go together, they glide together, and that's where they feel the best. And uh, there are some individuals where literally there will be a certain amount of estradiol uh, that's being metabolized from testosterone and tissues that will cause gynecomastia. So 
Sometimes it is the ratio of estradiol to total testosterone, and sometimes it literally is, you know, their estradiol just got too high, regardless of what their testosterone is, and regardless of what their estrogen to testosterone ratio is, their estradiol just got too high and they started developing gynecomastia. And ironically, um, you develop gynecomastia, you can prevent that by using an aromatase inhibitor. You can also use a serum like raloxifene, but you're not gonna be on a serum for long term for gynecomastia prevention on testosterone replacement. Um, you'd be way better off using an astrazole um, to lower your estradiol as long as your total testosterone isn't like crazy super physiologic. So let's say it's 800 nanograms per deciliter, your estradiol is 60 and you're developing gyno, let's put you on an AI so we can prevent that gyno from progressing further. And generally speaking, if you attack the gyno soon enough, it'll, it'll revert back to normal. Yeah, and how much you get uh, stimulation right. on the breast right. tissue. So, the, so, so think of gynecomastia as a side effect of testosterone. Think of some of those mood mm -hmm. effects. It's a side effect of testosterone. Don't think that it's right. estrogen per se. That doesn't make any sense because the gynecomastia and these other side effects that we're talking about here are directly consequential of estrogen. Uh, testosterone is one step removed, right? Because testosterone converts into estrogen. So yes, they go together, more est more testosterone and more estrogen, but estrogen is the, um, is the hormone that is causing gynecomastia, labile mood, insomnia, all these other problems. It's not testosterone that's causing it. So anytime you get a side effect from a drug, the answer is not to give you, the primary right. ideal answer is not to that's give yourself a drug, drug to reduce the side effects. Ideally, you wanna just tackle the problem at the root cause. The number one way to handle gynecomastia is you can just reduce the dose, even a little bit. It does not have to be a significant dose reduction. This depends and it's man per man. So yes, you can reduce the dose, but if the individual is at 700 nanograms per deciliter total testosterone and their estradiol is 70 and their gynecomastia, reducing the dose may actually have an unfavorable uh, estradiol to total testosterone ratio, or they may end up at 500 nanograms per deciliter total testosterone and 50 or 60 picograms per milliliter of estradiol, and their ra their ratio is way fucking off, and they s still have gynecomastia. So it really depends on the individual because some people can lower their dose and have their gynecomastia resolve. Other people will lower their dose and they'll still have a disfavorable estrogen to testosterone ratio and they'll continue to have a progression of gynecomastia where an aromatase inhibitor intervention would prevent this from um, being exacerbated or uh, pre prevent the continual growth of breast tissue in a, in a man on testosterone replacement. So the key thing you want to do whenever you get excessively moody after you start testosterone or whenever you get gynecomastia, whatever the case may be, you just need and to micro, lower your dose. Let's talk about microdosing. You right? don't want it. Or, yeah, low, you can lower your dose or you can do what's called microdosing. So microdosing, they're talking about doing daily or every other day injections to, to prevent this big peak in your testosterone. So you prevent this peak of conversion of testosterone into estrogen. And again, this is a, the, the primary way you should try to manage your protocol to, to prevent estrogenic side effects is by lowering your dosage if your dosage is too high or and or... Um, adjusting your dosage frequency. So you could do this microdosing, which is you know, injecting, splitting your injections up into every day or every other day injections, or even every three days if you're doing weekly injections, dropping it down to every three day injections. Um, you can do this microdosing to prevent this big peak in conversion into estrogen. So I don't disagree with them here. But as you'll hear anabolic docs say here in a minute, uh, some people can't ad adhere to such a structured, structured protocol where they have to inject every single day into their, their muscle belly. Um, they're gonna get sick of doing it. And if they start injecting less frequently, they may have a higher conversion of testosterone into estrogen, and they're gonna run into the same problems that they had before, where they have high estrogenic side effects, and lowering the dosage doesn't prevent, this from ha uh, prevent the side effects from occurring. Now, this is just an, an example. For some people, they could just go back to the protocol that they were on and lower their dose and they don't have estrogenic side effects anymore. But for some people, that's not the case. They go back to you know a less structured, strict protocol and they have high estrogenic side effects. 
and they can't they just can't get around it by lowering their dosage um so then they need an impl to implement a small dose of an aromatase inhibitor to feel well in contrast that when you give it to yourself subcutaneously one benefit is number one you get better absorption so you do you do not need to use as high of a dose you only need about 15 percent of your im dose i've seen this study quoted multiple times and i think anecdotal data trumps the research in this case most individuals who inject subcutaneously are going to have a lower total testosterone than people who inject intramuscularly this is my own personal opinion it goes against this paper that he's referencing and that i've seen referenced many times the reason I believe this to be true is not only because I've never seen somebody go from sub Q to, or I, I am to sub Q intramuscular to subcutaneous and have their testosterone rise. It's also because of the, the pharmacokinetics of injecting subcutaneously. When you inject an oily based substance like testosterone into an oily environment like fatty lipid tissue, it's going to mix and have a slower absorption rate than if you were to inject that oil into a watery environment like muscle or it will be more quickly swept up into the bloodstream. So it's going to sit there and have a prolonged absorption period, which is going to prolong its half-life substantially and decrease your total testosterone on labs. So I'm going against the research here. Uh, there's only one paper I've seen come out with that he's referencing here. This is the one that I've seen where it says you only need 15% of your dose sub Q than you do IM to get the same total testosterone. I completely disagree with this, not only based on anecdotal data, but also because of the pharmacokinetics of injecting an oil into a fatty environment where it's going to sit there and slowly be absorbed, prolonging its half-life and decreasing your total testosterone. And there are studies showing that going from IM dosing to sub Q dosing can reduce side effects. It can reduce side effects. Generally, it reduces side effects because the dosage, your total testosterone is going to be lower and you're going to have a lower conversion of testosterone into estrogen. So I agree. And, and, and you're going to have this very prolonged half-life. So you're not going to have these giant peaks and troughs. So it's almost like you're injecting really frequently with really small doses. It's kind of mimicking that. So I think he's incorrect in his assumption that it just generally causes less side effects uh, I think it's because it has a prolonged half-life. It's going to decrease, not only you're, you're gonna have less total, total testosterone, which is gonna decrease the amount that's converted into estrogen, but you're also going to have this prolonged half-life, which means you're not gonna have this, any big peak or trough. You're gonna have a very, 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 very smooth and flat um, peak trough curve, and that's going to reduce the uh, bolus conversion of testosterone into estrogen. But you, you want to understand, are you right after the injection, Dr. Bronson, right? Are you going up? Are you peaked? Are you going down? It's, is it two weeks later, a week later, two days? Are you on Masteron, Primo? This is something that I've talked about before on my subreddit, r slash TRT help, which is um, you, we know the pharmacokinetics of of injecting intramuscularly. We know it generally peaks 24 to 20, 48 hours after injection. And we know when your trough is, it's the day you inject before you inject. With subcutaneous injections, we don't know the pharmacokinetics um, and it's very going, going to be very individual uh, person to person. We don't know the pharmacokinetics of injecting subcutaneous. So we don't know exactly when it peaks. Um, we don't know exactly when it troughs. Uh, we don't know exactly how stable it is. It, should be theoretically extremely stable and it should have a prolonged half-life again leading to a decrease in total testosterone but um it's one of the one of the benefits of injecting intramuscularly is we know you know when to grab labs how to interpret labs and uh, things like that he also mentions that people are going to be on these frequent injecting protocols these microdosing protocols and then you know years down the line they're just not going to have the stamina for it they're going to get tired of injecting every morning they're just gonna wanna do it once a week, every Sunday, and and that be it. But then you have the problem of having this peak of testosterone, and then you have that conversion into estrogen again, and now you have this high estrogenic, the person's having high estrogenic side effects, and now you have to manage that again. So what are you gonna do? Are you gonna lower the dose and then go or go back to the frequent injections? Uh, so a lot of people don't want to lower their dose because, you know, say their peak is at a thousand and their trough is at, you know, 600 or 500 or whatever. They're not going to want to lower their dose anymore because their trough is going to be too low. So then you're going to have to, what's your other option? You're going to have to introduce an aromatase inhibitor. So 
depending on the person, you know, some people can really keep up myself personally for the past five years. Um, I can keep up with a every other day injection protocol just fine. It doesn't bother me. But for some people, it's going to be a make or break deal. Uh, just like hair loss, for example, it's going to be a make or break deal for getting for for testosterone replacement is maintaining this frequent injection protocol and they're gonna get fucking sick of it and they're just gonna want to inject weekly i prefer to inject weekly but if i inject weekly i'd have i'd have side effects that i would have to manage using an aromatase inhibitor so what happens when somebody gives up on their frequent injection protocol they're going to switch to something like weekly and they're going to have to use an aromatase inhibitor to feel well can you live on a, on a blocker? I don't like to live on those blockers because they're adverse for the brain, the sex, and for the tendons and the heart. Yeah, and now we know that if you're on those blockers long-term, one of the key benefits of testosterone therapy, reducing visceral fat mass, you don't get that benefit. Why aren't we talking about diet and exercise versus leaving your estrogen alone? Diet and exercise is going to decrease your visceral fat, fat mass way more than if you just let your estrogen ride at 90 picograms per milliliter when you could feel better when it's at and you are taking 0.25 milligrams of an astrazole twice a week and your estrogen's at 40, you have no side effects and you can go work out at the gym and do your cardio and be healthy and fit and not have this visceral fat. So it's if you take two people, two groups of people, one group is on testosterone replacement and they let their estrogen ride high and they sit on the couch doing nothing all day but drinking fucking ice cream from a popcorn tub and then you take the other group who who takes an aromatase inhibitor and but goes to the gym and they do cardio and weightlifting and they stay lean and fit and healthy uh who's going to have more visceral fat mass it's going to be the person who lets their estrogen ride high so really it's negligible this argument about visceral fat um it doesn't fucking matter that your estrogen is managed with an aromatase inhibitor if you're exercising and dieting properly and, and I'm not saying like dieting and exercising like a bodybuilder would for a prep, but just saying staying generally healthy and lean is going to prevent this development of, of visceral fat mass way more than just letting your estrogen ride high. Yes, it's true, most likely, that estrogi estradiol is going to help reduce visceral fat mass. But again, the comparison is 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 huge where exercise and diet is going to trump you know, at the estrogen's benefit of, of uh, metabolizing visceral fat by a huge margin. At least you don't get that benefit to the same degree as people who just leave their estrogen alone. Whatever your testosterone level is, your estradiol level needs to be allowed to rise in tandem with your testosterone level. So it needs to be allowed to rise in tandem with your testosterone levels to a certain limit. Like, yes, it's going to increase when you get on testosterone replacement, but you can't just let it increase indefinitely. And there are some people who are high aromatizers who have a, a genetic predisposition to aromatizing heavily. So they're going to have, they're talking about the estrogen to testosterone ratio. They're going to have a very mismanaged, misbalanced testosterone to estrogen, estrogen ratio and feel unwell. So you can't just let somebody's estrogen go run wild. You have to manage it in some way, especially if they're having side effects. The general consensus about leaving estrogen alone is a bit complicated, you know? So we cover a few topics there. One, uh, some people are very sensitive to estrogenic side effects and some people are not. Um, two, some people do actually feel estrogenic side effects over a certain number, regardless of their total testosterone, although a large amount of people are going to have a have a preferable testosterone to estrogen ratio, but you're not going to know exactly what that is man per man. So generally speaking, speaking, you're going to have to go by labs, what their total testosterone and estradiol is, ultra sensitive and LCMS for the total testosterone for most accurate readings. And you're going to have to take a look at their symptoms and compare them and then make adjustments and then compare symptoms to labs, symptoms to labs, symptoms to labs until they're dialed in. Um, that's how it should always go. And if somebody is having high estrogen side effects, and they can't get dialed in um, using by lowering their dose and or microdosing, then implementing a low dose of an aromatase inhibitor is a wise thing to do. I do think that uh, I, I completely agree with the anabolic doc that the co cookie cutter protocols of 200 milligrams plus you know half an AI twice a week is ridiculous because you're putting somebody at risk for um, even greater side effects or even harm if somebody again has high blood pressure to begin with and you put them on high dose protocol and that an astrazole isn't quite enough to lower the water retention 
they're going to have significant water retention from this high dose protocol. Um, and then they, that can put them in a hypertensive crisis. So again, I always think starting low with your dose of testosterone and splitting it maybe into white toilet into two, two injections per week is going to be a wise move. I, I always say start at 100 milligrams, split into two injections and then adjust at your eight week labs and then adjust after your five week labs after that. And you should be good to go. I think you can get dialed in the fastest this way. And uh, I generally recommend starting at 100 milligrams per week. Um, for some people that might put them too low, but generally speaking, I'd say 90% of the time, it's not gonna put you lower than you were, especially if you're below 300 nanograms per deciliter. Um, 100 milligrams twice split into two injections is not gonna put you lower than you were. So um, you're gonna be better off anyway. You're gonna be 100 points, 200 points higher. And then at your labs, you can adjust. You can increase your injection frequency or something if you want to, and then raise your dose by 20 milligrams and then get labs again and then make one more adjustment and then you're pretty much there. I've made a video on how to get dialed in on TRT lightning fast and I'll link that up in the corner. But um, yeah, those are my opinions on this video on how blocking estrogen kills a major benefit of TRT. Again, that visceral fat argument I think is really fucking stupid because it doesn't even compare to exercise and diet. Uh, it doesn't shine a light to exercise and diet as far as controlling weight gain, fat gain, both subcutaneous fat and visceral fat. Anyway, those are my thoughts on this video. I think he went a little bit too far, um, especially his guests. I think Dr. Thomas O'Connor was kind of trying to be like, hey, it's man per man, but he was letting these guests do mo most of the talking. And um, I think his guest was wrong in a lot of uh, areas here uh, with Dr. Bronson. So anyway, that's my opinion on the video. Let me know what you guys think about uh, letting your estrogen ride high or using an aromatase inhibitor or managing your protocol so that you don't have estrogen, estrogenic side effects, what you've done to manage that. Okay, appreciate y'all. Talk to you later. Bye.